We Infuse Podcast, episode number 66. Welcome to the We Infuse Podcast. My name is Amanda Brummett. In every episode, we give you a seat at the table as we talk to Infusion Center owners, operators, and experts so that you can get the insight you need to run a thriving practice. In this episode, we talk with Luba Sobolevsky, founder, president, and CEO of the Immunoglobulin National Society. Luba shares how and why IGNS was created, the amazing accomplishments they've made, and exciting news about the creation of a Center of Excellence designation. Well, Luba, thank you so much for being here with us today. Can you start by telling our listeners a little bit about who you are and sharing your background? Sure. Pleasure. And thank you so much for having me on. Um, I'm a, a doctor of pharmacy. Uh, I got my PharmD from a USC many, many years ago. I started out as a clinician and uh, worked my way through various areas of practice and um, ended up in the pharmaceutical industry. I so happened to um, have landed in the immunoglobulin therapy area and spent over a decade in the pharma industry. And having had the background from the clinical side, from the industry side, it gave me a really comprehensive perspective on what was going on in our field. And that um, it became evident at that point that being uh, for being such a specialized field of therapy as IG therapy is, it's probably only second to chemotherapy in its complexity, wow. as well as the complexity of our patients. So given that, the fact that we had absolutely no standards of practice for clinicians in the therapy area, now I don't mean diagnostically speaking, sure. Physicians have had uh, standards for diagnosis and dosing for a variety of disorders with immunoglobulin therapy, but we had absolutely nothing to support nurses and pharmacists that um, manage over 90% of what happens with the patient on this therapy. And so given the complexity of patients in the use of this product in over 70 different clinical indications that are evidence-based and FDA approved. We had no standards, uh, no measurable way to, um, to check whether someone has expertise to actually treat patients with this uh, group of therapies. Uh, we didn't have uh, standardized education or resources. And we expected a lot of our clinicians, we expected that they mitigate side effects, improve safety, maintain clinical outcomes, um, manage these patients throughout their continuum of care. These are chronically ill patients who are on IG therapy for life. We were expecting a lot from the clinicians, while as an industry, we're giving them absolutely nothing um, to make that happen. Um, and so that was the impetus, really. And that was where my career kind of um, took me. Yeah. So then how, how did you end up at the Immunoglobulin National Society? So that was really the, the junction uh, in my career where it became evident what was needed, what was lacking. And um, it was this clarity that enabled uh, me and a group of clinicians to kind of get together and start assessing what was needed. Wait, so, so you guys started the society? Yes. Oh, how yes. amazing. I didn't know that. Yeah. Congratulations and thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So um, at the very start of IGNS was this very memorable survey of around 400 nurses and pharmacists who we assessed for where they get training, whether we get they get training, what was needed. Because when you're starting something brand new, you really need to understand what the needs are in the field versus sure. what we assume, you know, the needs are. And it was it was really interesting because we found out that over 90% of clinicians did not have any formal training in this therapy. Certainly, it's not taught in pharmacy nursing schools. 
As a pharmacist, I had one hour of IG therapy coursework. And that was pretty much it. And so we as clinicians get out of our schools, pharmacy, nursing school specifically, with really zero understanding and knowledge. And so the learning until, you know, up until the point of um, IGNS a start was taking place at the workplace. And so when we ask clinicians how they began and how they were trained and whether they were trained, interestingly, most clinicians thought that they were being trained and they did receive education in this Mm -hmm. therapy. And so when we ask them how, the two predominant ways were, they were reported as, one, reading the package insert. It's a good start. Great. It's a good start. It's a good product-focused um, information. It's certainly not education or training no. in, in its formal sense, and it's not enough. And second was shadowing a superior. So the immediate question is, who trained that superior? Exactly. And so when we got a group of subject matter experts, really seasoned healthcare professionals who had been in this industry for a long time, who had managed clinical teams and were really involved deeply in the immunoglobulin therapy practice, we found out that there were... uh, there were aspects of their practice that had common ground, common standards, right, and, and competencies that they achieved. But I think an equal percentage was just wildly all over the place. And we realized that if a patient switches from pharmacy A to infusion mm-hmm. center B back to another treatment center based on the pair and their preference and their lifestyle, they will be getting a a completely different experience with this therapy. Right. And we knew that the first thing that needed to happen was that we needed to create the standards of practice for immunoglobulin therapy. Absolutely. And so that was kind of, that was the beginning. That was the very, very beginning with that practice survey that we did. And what year did all that happen? That was 2012. Yeah. That is amazing. Absolutely amazing. Well, thank you for taking that jump and and, and doing that. Um, So tell us uh, what IGNS looks like today. Yeah. So fast forwarding to 2024, IGNS now is the central standard setting Um. Healthcare Association dedicated to the field of immunoglobulin therapy and biologics. So we've expanded to include immune mediated disorders and therapies Mm -hmm. as it pertains to what our patients face and what our clinicians need as well. As the standard setting association, of course, we create, maintain, and incorporate the national standards of practice, which are the only standards of practice in this um, therapy space um, that are legally defensible and evidence-based. We um, also have developed a robust credentialing program for nurses and pharmacists. It's a way for these clinicians to achieve a prestigious credential of IG certified nurse, IGCN, or IGCP, IG certified pharmacist, which is the only objective, measurable way to demonstrate someone's very specialized expertise in this area. We also develop um, a systematic uh, educational resource through online webinars and podcasts, also um, our live conferences. And we provide um, overall a full suite of supporting practice-based resources for any clinician in this field. So that's, that's kind of uh, the, the big wow. picture of what we do. There are four pillars, standard certification, education, 
and resources. Amazing. That's a lot in just 12 years. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So I'm sure there have been some huge milestones and accomplishments along the way. Can you share some of those? Sure. Well, I do think that in the just shy of a decade and a half, the four pillars we just talked about were our absolutely major milestones. I will say that in addition to that, um, our patient 360 arm of IGNS that we started around seven years ago Mm -hmm. is something we are absolutely so proud of. We knew that if we are, um, you know, everything we do at IGNS, everything we stand for has to do 100% with patients, making sure patients receive the best clinical care at every infusion, the Mm safest practice, that they are meeting their treatment goals and that they're overall uh, improving their health and quality of life. And so we began the Patient 360 program as a way to determine whether changes in practice for healthcare professionals that we were incorporating along the way were actually making an impactful change on the patients. That's ambitious. Yes, (laughs) it was, it is. But it, it, it continues to be the most rewarding part of what we do. Yeah, and one that's enriching um, all of us as an association and as a clinical field. So currently, our patient three hundred and sixty program consists of a variety of um, areas. One of which is our national conference for patients. It's a two day virtual program, uh, full of enriching sessions uh, with leading experts, uh, sessions that help patients understand their disorder, understand their therapy options, ways to improve their infusion experience, ways to improve their lifestyle and quality of life with a variety of other um, impactful ways like nutrition, stress management, support for um, caregivers, and families, and and lots of other advocacy topics. At the same time, this Patient 360 program gives us an opportunity to do research with patients. And if we've had an annual uh, Patient 360 survey, um, which we publish annually at our national conference, the survey allows us to really keep kind of our finger on the pulse of what's happening with the patients, yeah. right? And if there are any issues in their pra- in, in their infusion experience or their treatment, we have a really great way of determining what's going on. So this is a, almost a real-time mechanism where you can give meaningful intervention? Exactly. So if you think about our national conference, for example, where we have clinicians or Mm-hmm. Overall, our members who are clinicians who can then see directly what the results of the patient survey is every year. And these are patients that are referred to us by our members. Yeah. So whether, you know, what we think the, the level of practice is really isn't, isn't that relevant if the patients are telling us a different story. Right. And in fact, there are times when we get results back that gives us pause and really are not what we expected, not what we want to see. But it also gives us the that push to continue to improve from the association standpoint, education, resources, topics, right? touch points with our clinicians, delivery of this data to them. And from the clinician's perspective, certainly taking that internally and changing their processes. Sure. And then are you guys also watching for trends in that data and then widespread re-education on topics? Absolutely. And we we are able to actually note trends um, very early on because we have these signals that come from this Patient 360 survey. That's a, a pretty robust um, program. And so that's that's something that that 
we, we are super committed to and very proud of this patient 360 conference is completely free to our patients and caregivers. Wow. And so it's a way for us to give back to this patient community. And, um, and they do so much for us to, yeah. you know, they educate us in ways we could never otherwise be. So this is something that, that is a lifelong commitment for IGNS. So that's one of the major milestones for us. Another, I would say this, this, uh, you know, obviously the f- patient focus to us is super important. But if we think about what we can do for the clinicians to support them even further, mm-hmm. um, IGNS has um, the largest scholarship program for clinicians who are licensed. That's a very important d- distinction because most of the time scholarships are awarded to students. Right. Once we have our license and we are practicing clinicians, we don't have any opportunities to really get funding to continue our education. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, knowing our field intimately well, we also know that there's turnover, you know, within the HCP world. There mm-hmm. are many nurses and pharmacists who enter this field coming from different areas of practice. Um, as we talked about a little bit earlier, there's basically no education on immunoglobulin therapy in professional schools, nursing pharmacy. Mm. And so when someone changes their career and starts working at a specialty pharmacy or a specialty infusion company, home infusion, infusion center, they you can presume with a high degree of certainty they've had no training or education in this field. Yikes. So how do we continue going, taking this all the way back to the patient? How do we make sure the patient gets highest quality, safest care every time? Mm-hmm. Is, is, is So we're, we're trying to solve for that, right? And what it's going to take, what it has taken, is us taking a stand as, as an association and saying, we're going to invest into this. And so every year, there's over 100 full scholarship attendees at our national conference. Wow. Their scholarship includes not only the attendance of the conference and the pre-conference seminars, but also the cost of certification to become a IGCN or IGCP. We provide them with an annual um, IGNS membership to get access to free education. We provide a variety of resources to support their practice. So it's a kind of a full turnkey scholarship program to get someone who is new to this field all the way up to the level of expertise that we all would like them to have and that they would like to attain. And to date, we have funded over a million dollars in scholarships um, in the U.S. That's incredible. Yes. Nurses, pharmacists, and physician fellows. Oh, great. Yeah. We know that physicians uh, coming out of their fellowships, regardless of their area of expertise, and there are many, neurology, immunology, allergy, oncology, hematology whatever those uh, fields may be, they get very little education and training uh, with respect to immunoglobulin specifically. Mm. Yeah, they know, obviously, the dosing guidelines and the treatment guidelines, diagnostic guidelines, but not what happens with the patient mm-hmm. once the patient's out on service at pharmacy, home infusion, infusion centers, and so forth, regardless of site of care. And so we also have a program for clinicians that um that is multidisciplinary and i think that's one of the key things too that distinguishes us from many other um associations that we are multidisciplinary mm-hmm. so we include all healthcare professionals pharmacists nurses physicians but also that these clinicians study learn together right 
as they do in real life, because immunoglobulin practice is very Mm team-based, and so is our education. Fantastic. So you guys have had some incredible accomplishments. What kind of goals do you set from there? I mean, obviously, uh, as this field expands and the IG therapy field seems to be growing, uh, I know the companies, manufacturers are investing heavily into new clinical trials. Our um, rate of diagnosis is becoming better and better. Our population is aging. Um, We are creating different sites of practice to support this therapy. And so as we continue to expand, uh, we're always learning and trying to figure out ways to support our clinicians and our patients. Uh, One of the newest initiatives, and this is something we are very, very excited about, is the establishment of IGNS Centers of Excellence, which is going to be a distinction that providers can attain to really uh, stand out, to differentiate their clinical services and the quality of the care they provide to patients. Up to this point, we have been providing individual clinicians with a way to distinguish their expertise through IGCN and IGCP certification. But now, within the next year, there will be a way for providers, for companies to attain a distinction as a center of excellence. And so I think that this will be instrumental in raising the bar across the field in in our practice setting. For sure. Across all practice settings. So we're very excited about this. Yeah, and something objective that payers and patients and referring physicians can search for easily. Of course, it gives you a measurable way to distinguish um, your clinical practice, your services from someone else who may not be able to achieve that distinction. And certainly it has benefits in payer contracts and beyond. So um, it both allows the providers to become more competitive, um, but also to demonstrate and document what that means for patients and for prescribers and their other customers, for sure. Excellent. That's impressive. So Luba, I also understand you guys now have a partnership with RX Toolkit. Can you tell us about that? Oh, yes. This, this was a very exciting partnership that IGNS and RX Toolkit entered late last year. And it allows the members of RX Toolkit to access a select number of our most popular IGNS uh, continuing education webinars. Oh, fantastic. And so, yeah. So we went through and selected um, a number, I think it's 20 webinars. That would be most relevant to the RX Toolkit members and shared them. And so now we have a larger population of clinicians who have access to the education and training that they really need, specifically in immunoglobulin therapy. Because we are really the only association that provides uh, this detailed systematic education in IG and biologics as well. And so I think it's just such a win for the RX Toolkit members. And it's, uh, we're super excited to share those resources. Awesome. What a good collaboration. Yes, absolutely. Let's shift gears just a little bit and talk about what, what you've experienced in infusion practice and let us learn from your wisdom. What would you say has been your biggest challenge? in the infusion space? Well, if you ask anybody about challenges (laughs) in our infusion space, I think the the list uh, kind of goes on and on. I I mean, you can pick 27 challenges if you want. Let's pick the top. Yeah, let's the top three. (laughs) I think that there, I mean, obviously there are different levels of challenges, right? There's there's, uh, legislation, payer, right, level. 
There's the side of care issues and reimbursement. There's the HCP nursing turnover. Um, there's the access to education. There's uh, access to support and funding by providers uh, for their clinical teams to become certified, educated, attend conferences. So there's a variety of challenges in our field. Um, I think our field is one of the most complex, but probably within healthcare, there's probably a resounding um, kind of number of these challenges. And to me, it's always about, you know, now what? So what do we do? How do we support practice? How do we make it easier for our field to continue to serve our patients? And that's what we try to focus on, right? So we try to focus on assessing the needs, right? Always, always understanding what the needs, what the critical gaps are, and trying to to help meet our clinicians where they need us the most. So I'll give you one example. About 25 years ago, IG therapy started to be utilized in the home setting. Until then, it was used in a controlled setting. And there was a lot of, this was not a, an easy transition. It's certainly clear why it, it is, um, it can decrease healthcare costs, but there was a lot of concern about safety and, and, and um, just the logistics of it and mm -hmm. just everything to do with it was brand new and, and unknown. And the, Obviously, throughout the years, uh, we've been able to successfully, as a, as a industry, transition patients into the home setting, give them the option of flexibility. Uh, some patients continue to get treated in the infusion center. Um, others get treated at home. Then we um, experienced this entrance of subcutaneous IG products, which gave, which gave patients even more flexibility. So the field has kind of shifted and changed, and this was kind of the mainstay of therapy. In the recent years, with changes to reimbursement, there is a very significant flow of patients back into um, AIC space. And, I mean, this is already happening. And the concern that we have, for example, one of the concerns is that this is not a space where we've had a lot of immunoglobulin therapy use in the recent couple of decades. The kind of the setting of an infusion space does not provide for a one-to-one -one nurse to patient ratio as you would elsewhere. And the clinicians who are currently working in these AICs or multi-specialty groups don't really have a lot of experience with immunoglobulin. And so just like when with anything that's new, it takes a while for, for clinicians and providers as a whole to really understand the complexity of this therapy, that you cannot treat IG therapy as any other biologic or drug, that it has its own standards for a reason. And that we have to maintain patient safety above all else. Mm -hmm. So now our, our, one of our priorities is to educate the AIC space as a whole to provide more opportunities to clinicians who are in the AIC space, for example, mm -hmm. um, to get the standards, to become certified, to attend conferences, to seek out these educational opportunities. Luckily, we make it very easy through IGNS membership. All the education is free. There's a ton of free resources. Uh, members get exclusive rates on certifications, publications, and so forth. So we're doing our best to get everything um, that these clinicians need. But that's, that's a challenge. Whenever practice changes <laughs> like that, and we see it, it's a tidal wave. Uh, we need to be right there with the clinicians supporting them again to ensure 
the best patient outcomes. Yeah. Well, and, and you strike me as the kind of leader that you, you see an issue. We're going to come up with a solution. We're going to fix it. Well, I think IGNS's philosophy is, as a whole has always been very pragmatic, right? Our standards mm-hmm. are very practice focused, very pragmatic. Our sessions at our national conference tell you what to do, when to do it, why we're doing it, um, who the best candidate for that is. So it's very, very, very practice focused. And yes, I think that at the end of the day, if you know what your goals are, you know where you're going, you're trying to improve patient care, you're really looking at a field at this, at any problem um, holistically and just trying to do the right thing for your members and patients. Right. Well, in all the time that you've worked in the immunoglobulin space, what would you say has been your your biggest aha moment? Something you saw that, oh, we can fix this. Well, I really, the biggest light bulb was truly that, I think back to what we just talked about, is If you know what the issue is and solve for it, that will, that, that'll, that, that's what you need to do. That's what you need to focus on. Uh, when we were first starting, there were a lot of people, even in our kind of uh, among our committee members that had their doubts about, you know, does this therapy area even need its own standards? Can't this be part of something else? And as we continue to define what IG therapy is, we continue to define what the skill set and specialized education that that is needed to support it. It became very evident. So mm-hmm. I think that that moment of break it down to the basics, keep it simple, understand the need and address the need. Everything else follows, falls in place. Yeah, totally makes sense. All right. What are you most excited about in the industry currently? Well, now that we talked about all the challenges, right? <laughs> <laughs> what are you excited about fixing, maybe? <laughs> well, well, I will tell you this. Um, I'm always excited about technology, uh, the incredible machine learning and AI that's uh, coming into this field that we already see change is changing the way we diagnose patients, the way we uh, look for trends in in healthcare that improve the time, that shorten the time to diagnosis for many of our patients with rare diseases from something that is taking over a decade, decade even now. We published a paper recently um, on immune deficiency using AI technology. And it was really astounding that this is just readily available and we can do so much good with technology, how we reach patients that otherwise are unreachable. Um, So there's just, there's a ton of um, progress that's going on right now. But I'm always, you know, I always go back to the patient, the clinician. I have to say that year after year, when I'm at our national conference and I stand in the back of the room and I absorb who's there and why they're there, I, I'm thrilled that we have a, a field where each clinician is so devoted to their patients and to improving their practice that year over year we continue to grow. And, you know, like this year, we're going to have probably over 1,200. Uh, clinicians at our conference, these are folks who understand how important education and improvement in practice is, and they go to conferences and they improve their practice and they support their patients. So it's really exciting to see that every year over 50% of our attendees are brand new to IGNS. Really? As we continue to grow, yeah. And so while we have a obviously a very robust return rate of our um, conference attendees. Fifty percent are brand new. That's exciting, and so I, I'm ex- I'm always excited about building 
new programs, resources, um, ways to support our field and just continue to serve our patients in the best way we can. Sure. Yeah, that is really exciting. Well done. Thank you. (laughs) Well, Luba, you have been a wealth of information and you have an incredible background. With that, what is one piece of advice that you would leave our listeners with? Uh, Well, I think that really invest into your professional development. I... I know I speak for most of us who are clinicians or who are experts, regardless of what field you're in, right? Whether it's business or clinical or whatever it is. I think personal growth, professional growth are really important. When we stop growing, we become stagnant. And that's a really difficult place to be when you have a lifelong career. Right. And so invest in your professional development, attain certification, uh, certifications in whatever your practice setting is. Right. If it's IG, it's I- IGCN, IGCP. If it's something else, go for it In grow professionally, differentiate your practice. Mm-hmm. In our area, we're not generalists. We're highly specialized. Prove it, document it, achieve it. Get educated, get certified, invest in yourself. I can promise you that uh, as an association, we will always support you, invest in you, in, in, our, in the quality of practice, in our resources that are available to better our patients' lives and our clinicians' lives for that matter. Um, but that would be, yeah, I think that all of us need to take a critical look at our career trajectory. and make changes to improve ourselves and kind of our output, what we provide to our patients. I think that's, that's the bottom line. It's about the patients, really. That is incredible advice. Well, Luba, thank you for your time. Thank you for caring enough about the industry that when you saw a need, you, you gathered around bright minds and, and fixed it and created this organization. And thanks for all you do for patients. Thank you so much for having me on, Amanda. I appreciate it. It was so great to learn from Luba Sobolevsky of the Immunoglobulin National Society about Ig treatment and just how far they've come. I also really appreciate that at every decision point, there was a need in the industry and IGNS sought to fill it with standards, with education, with scholarships, frankly, with whatever patients and caregivers needed. Speaking of things that are good for patients and caregivers, if you aren't familiar with the WeInfuse software platform and RX Toolkit's web-based resources, I encourage you to check them out, as well as those IG courses that Luba mentioned. These tools can save you time and money in your practice while making infusions safer for patients and caregivers. My name is Amanda Brummett, and we'll catch you in the next episode.